All right, so we're going to get into the message now. So um, just if you have your Bibles, go ahead and turn to Hosea chapter 6. And I want to build upon what we looked at last Sunday. And uh, just as we are getting turned there, I just want to say a special thanks to the worship team. I, I needed that worship today. It was it really brought a good breakthrough for me. It was uh, needed. And I really appreciate the Lord doing that. Um, I, I, I'm excited about this series we're doing called uh, a great, The Great Reset in the Church. There is a divine reset. God himself, I believe, is initiating right now. I, I believe these are really good times for the church, for the remnant that want to really go on with the Lord. Um, and so I just want to build upon what we looked at last Sunday. So if you have your Bibles, let's go ahead and turn to Hosea chapter 6, verse 1. And we look at this last Sunday, but sometimes I know just, you know, being in the church, sometimes it's harder to hear a prophetic kind of message on Easter, you know, that, and, and so I just want to re reread this again for us, is con the Lord is saying to his church, I believe, from Hosea chapter 6, come and let us return to the Lord, for he has torn us, but he will heal us. I think 2020 has been a tearing of the Lord. I don't believe all that happened was something God initiated, but through that, God has brought a tearing in his church, a crucifixion in his church. A lot of people have gone through a lot of very difficult things, but I believe we're in a time of healing when God is wanting to heal the church of the effects of 2020 and even into 2021. He has wounded us, but he will bandage us. Now, here's where he's, he's leading us to. He will revive us after two days. After this death and this co-crucifixion that God has worked into the church to unite us with the death and crucifixion of Jesus Christ, Hosea is telling us he will raise us up on the third day. There is coming a revival and a resurrection coming to the church of Jesus Christ. And I believe I, I just some, a phrase the Lord has just put into my heart for, I don't know, three, four, five months now is a, it's a bridal revival. It's a bridal revival. God wants to bring a revival to the remnant of his church and revive us and awaken us with passion and, and a renewal and a filling of his presence and a filling of his glory so that we may live before him. And so that's kind of what God's plan is for the church. And I believe the Lord is saying to us, let us know, let us press on to know the Lord. God's intention for us is to know him intimately. That's God is a relational God. And his desire is, us, is for us to know him intimately. I'm going to talk about that in a uh, coming message. But his going forth is as certain as the dawn. He will come to us like the rain, like the spring rain watering the earth. I believe, I believe God is coming to his church. I'm not talking about the second coming of Jesus. I'm talking about an invasion of God into his presence. I mean, into his church. His presence invading the church. His glory coming into the church. And so I believe what we have experienced from 2020 into 2021 is a, is a great upheaval. You know, the church shutting down, the pandemic, the elections, the unrest in our nation, all the craziness that has happened I believe God is using that to bring this tearing and this wounding and this breaking because God is always about breaking down the old wineskin because he wants to fill new wineskins with him. Now understand this, God will only fill what he himself forms and fashions. God is only going to fill what he himself forms and fashions. That which is formed and fashioned by the hands of men, even good men. The creativity and the ingenuity and all the different things of men and their intellect and the resources they have and all their skills and gifts. God simply will not fill that wineskin that he has not formed and fashioned. And so for the Lord to have what he wants at the end of the age in a church a glorious church, Paul talked about that in Ephesians 5.27. We've said it for years and years and years. Before Jesus comes back, he will have a glorious church in the earth. 
And for the Lord to bring about that kind of glory in his house, he's got to tear down the old wineskins. He's got to tear down the old mindsets. He's got to tear down all that has been built by man. Because he simply will not build what he does not fashion. He will not fill what he has not formed. And so there is an absoluteness to this. And it's the absoluteness of Jesus Christ. God is building his house, not man. Unless the Lord builds the house, they labor in vain. It doesn't matter how big it is. It doesn't matter how influential it is. If God himself is not building his house, they labor in vain because it does not produce what he himself wants. There is an absoluteness to this, and it's Christ. Christ. That's why Paul said, be careful how you build. Be careful how you build. Be careful to, to the church, to us, to the church around the world. Be careful how you build after this uh, this great upheaval we have experienced. Be careful how you build back. Don't just go build back based on the models of 2019. God is tearing those down. He's wanting to create a new wineskin that he can fill with his glory. And so as we talk about, as we talk about a divine reset in the church or a great reset in the church, keep in mind the ultimate goal God has for the end time church is to fill the church with his glory. To fill the church with his glory. That is God's goal. God wants houses of glory around the earth. This house to be a house of glory. You know, all the, the church of Jesus Christ. I know it's only going to be a remnant because only a remnant is hungry. Only a remnant is going to respond. But it's not intended to be only a remnant. But it will be a remnant because only a remnant is hungry. But that is what God is wanting to build back here in this place is a house of glory. That the glory of God would fill this house. We had a taste of it today in worship. There's so much more though. And I want us to be hungry for that. Thirsty for that. Let us not be lukewarm, self-satisfied, apathetic, indifferent to say, okay, the, the old wine's good enough. The old wine is good enough. See, God wants to confront lukewarmness. God wants to confront apathy. God wants to confront indifference so that we would hunger for his glory. Only he can satisfy our hearts. Only he can satisfy our hearts. And if we're eating at the table of the world, day in and day out, that we have no appetite for the greater, which is God himself. The greater pleasure is God himself. God himself is the greatest pleasure you can ever experience. In his presence is fullness of joy. At his right hand are pleasures evermore. And so God wants to initiate a great reset in his church. And I talked a little bit about this last Sunday, but this Sunday I want to talk about a great reset as it pertains to vision. As it pertains to vision. Now, a lot of people in the church, they talk about vision. And, and what happens is they carry over this idea from the business world that says, okay, what's your vision? And so, you know, a lot of churches will say, well, our vision is to reach the world for Jesus Christ, or our vision is to take the unchurched and bring them into a growing relationship with Jesus Christ. Now, again, that's, there's nothing wrong with that, but that's not really vision. That's more mission. Vision pertains to, especially in the house of God, pertains to seeing the Lord. If we don't see the Lord himself, we will not have vision. See, vision is about seeing him. And I believe so much of the church has lost sight of the transcendence and the majesty of God. And we have built another God who is more culturally relevant, more tolerant, one we can put our arms around rather than going back to the God of the scriptures, rather than going back to the God who sits enthroned in heaven. 
And God wants to bring about a divine reset as it pertains to vision where we see the Lord sitting on the throne, high and exalted, the train of his robe filling the temple, where the, where the angels are crying out to one another, holy, 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 where the messengers of God see him and the, and the blazing glory of his holiness, and they are undone. Where is that in the church today? Where is the church being undone by the glory of God? To the point where Isaiah saw him in Isaiah 6 and he said, Whoa, is me. Where is that? May God bring it back. May God bring back the fear of the Lord into his church again. We need the fear of God back into his church again. We're not dealing here with Santa Claus or Mr. Rogers. We are dealing with the holy, transcendent God of heaven and earth who measures the universe by the span of his hand who numbers the stars by name. We are, we are dealing with the king of the universe, the transcendent majestic one. When Isaiah saw him in Isaiah 6, he was so undone. He said, I am ruined. When's the last time you came to church? Ruined. May God ruin us with his glory. Amen? So I want to, I want to talk about Today, a divine reset of vision. I want you to turn to Isaiah chapter 6, verse 1. I, I, I believe very strongly that Isaiah 6, 1 is, is a word that God is speaking to the church, especially in this nation. And I've kind of already talked about it, but I just want to, I want to read it here. In the year of King Uzziah's death... I saw the Lord, this is Isaiah writing, sitting on a throne, lofty and exalted with the train of his robe filling the temple. See, sometimes we don't see God until our hope in a, in a solution such as a political solution dies. We need to hear that. The American church needs to hear that. Because presently, there's not a solution for the crisis our nation is facing. King Uzziah was, was a king in Israel's history who made Israel great again. Israel went through a hundred-year period where they hadn't experienced much success, much prosperity, much breakthrough. And God raised up King Uzziah. And King Uzziah, he was, whenever he sought the Lord, he prospered. Whenever he sought the Lord, God blessed him. Whenever he sought the Lord, whatever he put his hands to began to prosper. King Uzziah began to have incredible success in military and incredible uh, building projects. In other words, I think we can relate to, to this. He was making Israel great again back then. But there came a time in King Uzziah's life when because of his success, pride entered into his heart and he acted presumptuously and that presumption drove him to go into the temple to burn incense an act that was forbidden by kings to do only priests could do and God immediately struck him with leprosy and he lived in isolation until the day of his death and so Isaiah here is coming in Isaiah chapter 6 and he's saying in that year when King Uzziah died in that year when Israel was no longer on a pathway to being great again, you hear what I'm saying? It speaks to the current condition. Don't, get, don't miss what I'm saying. I love my country so much. I, I love this nation. It grieves me where we're going. It breaks my heart where we're going. But I'm convinced there is not a political solution to the crisis America faces. There is not. The good news is, the good news is, and here's the good news. It's the year when that, when that dies in us, when the hope of our political aspirations to be great again dies, then the Lord is revealed. And we need the Lord way more than we need our country to be great. Again, I want our country to be great, but seeing the Lord high and exalted, the train of his robe filling the temple, and all the, the, the angels crying out, holy, 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 
is the Lord God Almighty. That transcends anything we could ever have in this life. We simply need to see the Lord again, like Isaiah, like John, like Drew was singing about today, the eyes of fire blazing out of Jesus Christ, a storm of fire around him. If only we could see him. I mean, when John the Beloved, he laid his head upon the breast of Jesus in his earthly life, he was the most intimate with Jesus of all the disciples. He called himself, I'm the one Jesus loves. Yet on that Isle of Patmos, imprisoned by the Roman emperor for preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ, on the Lord's day, John was taking into the spirit on the Lord's day, and he beheld the Lord and the, the glory of Jesus, his friend that he was so intimate with, the glory that shined from his face as he beheld him caused John to fall down like a dead man, just like Isaiah. Anyone that's ever seen the Lord and his glory and his radiance and his splendor has fallen down like a dead man and said, woe is me, I am ruined, I am undone. May we recover the glory of God once again in the church. Amen? We have way too low of a vision of God. We think he's like us. We think our thoughts are like his. We think our ways are like his. And he is so transcendent, infinitely transcendent above all of us put together. Every human mind put together throughout history cannot even come close to touching the wisdom of God. From him, through him, and to him are all things. To him be the glory in the church through Jesus Christ. See, we need a recovery of vision. The church has put God on our own level. And when Isaiah saw him, when, when that time came, when his political idol crashed and the political idols in Israel came down and they realized maybe God is not so interested in making Israel great again as he is in revealing the glory of God to his people. When that happened, then Isaiah saw the Lord and it ruined him forever. It ruined him forever. He was undone forever. And then the message and the proclamation, that was his commissioning as a prophet. There is no, you know, we've seen, and I've, we've hit on it so much, I'm not going to repeat it, but we've seen the, the failed Trump prophecies that have been 40 plus prophets wrongly prophesied Donald Trump. We've talked a lot about that. But true prophetic ministry comes from seeing the Lord. And declaring God's heart, God's ways, God's beauty, God's majesty, God's holiness, the transcendence of God, the King of kings and Lord of lords, uh, declaring him. And so when Isaiah saw him, he said, woe is me, I am ruined. I, the first thing he realized was his lips. The words he was speaking were unholy. He had been preaching another man. He had been preaching himself. And he was undone. He was ruined. And, but an angel came, and it shows you the heart of God. An angel came and touched his lips with a coal of fire, purified his lips, and made him a prophet that would declare not only God's plans to make Israel great, which he did, and he did, will do, God will do that, and I believe still God has a plan for America. I don't believe God's plan with America is over. The point is, we've got to come back to seeing the Lord high and exalted, seeing the Lord sitting on the throne. We are worshiping a, a, the, the God that we has been created in the American church is an idol. It's another Jesus, and we've got to come back to the true Jesus, the real Jesus, the, the scriptural, biblical Jesus, transcendent, sitting on a throne. In fact, when John was writing his gospel in John chapter 12, he referenced Isaiah chapter 6. And he said this, he said, when Isaiah saw the Lord on the throne, he saw Jesus in his pre-incarnate form. Now I'm paraphrasing, but basically John was telling us when Isaiah saw the Lord on the throne, he was not just seeing God, he was seeing Jesus himself. 
the King of kings and Lord of lords. The whole earth is full of his glory. So if we're going to have any, uh, any type of divine reset, if we're going to have any type of a mission in the church to build back the way God intends to build back, we've got to recover that vision once again of seeing the Lord. We've got to see the Lord. The holiness of who he is. The glory of of who he is, the fear of who he is, the goodness of who he is, the just judge who he is, the bridegroom that he is. I mean, I could list so many different characteristics. He's infinite, but we've got to come back to that transcendent view of God that we know God is not like us. He is transcendent. I believe God in this season that the church has been through has exposed political idolatry in the church. Amen? And I believe the Lord is wanting to, to bring that to a confrontational head and say that that political idol worship of trusting in any politician or president or any king to deliver us has to die before we can see the Lord. And I believe that that is exactly what God's intention is. He's confronted that. In the year of King Uzziah's death, I saw the Lord. I believe the church is now destined, and it's even a, a moving of the Spirit of God, where the Lord is going to begin to unveil the Lord to us, where we see him once again for who he is in the majesty and the splendor of who he is. And when we see him, we will never ever be able to go back to our old ways. <laughs> we'll never be able to go back to doing church as normal. Not that we've ever done church as normal. I don't think we've ever had a normal service here. But you get the point. Church as normal is dead. This whole idea of an American Jesus is dead. God is bringing it to death. God is confronting the idol worship in his church of placing hope in political messiahs. And God is saying when that now is confronted and it dies and it has died, then the church can see the Lord high and exalted, the train of his robe filling the temple where the angels cry, holy. Holy, holy is the Lord. Amen. When Moses, when Moses prayed, he said in Exodus 34, he said, or Exodus 33, Exodus 34, he said, Lord, don't let your presence go from me. And I love that. I love that. Moses was like, I don't, the promised land without you is no promised land at all. Unless your presence goes with us, don't send us from here. I mean, how many churches in this nation and around the world are operating without one ounce of the presence of God in there and they don't know it and they don't even care? May God make us desperate for the presence of God. Thankfully, we have a great presence of God. We want more. We want way more. But thankfully, our hearts are hungry. Our hearts are thirsty. But Moses was like, don't send me out from this place unless your presence goes with me. And then Moses said, show me your glory. May that be the cry of our heart. May that be the cry of in our heart, Lord, show me your glory. See, God wants to make the church glorious at the end of the age. And for the church to be glorious at the end of the age, then his glory must come back into the house of God. Because we are only glorious by beholding his glory. Paul said that we are transformed into the image of God from glory to glory by the Spirit. We have to behold him to become like him. We have to behold him to become like him. We have to see him to be transformed into his image. And so Moses said, Lord, show me your glory. Let's turn to Exodus 33, verse 19. 
I want you to see this. It's, it's even what we sing about today. That's why I was so encouraged by that song. He is good. Exodus 33, 19. Moses is saying, show me your glory. And you would think God warns Moses. He, I mean, this is, this is who we're dealing with. God warns Moses. He says, listen, Moses, I really love you. I really enjoy you, but I want to protect you because if I come in my glory and you see me, you will die. That's, that's who we're dealing with. And so, but God is so relational. God so wants relationship with us that he tells Moses, he says, if you look on me, you'll die. So you've got to, if I'm, when I come down, if you really want me to show you my glory, if I come down, you have got to hide yourself in the cleft of the rock. Otherwise, when I come down and you see me, you will instantly die. That's who we're dealing with. And you would think at the revelation of the glory of God, you would, you would see something like this massive upheaval of tornadoes and hurricanes and wind and upheaval and all this. But instead, look at what God says. He says, I will, show, I will make all my goodness pass before you. See that? God's glory is all of his goodness. That's the kind of God he is. He is so transcendent, but yet he wants a relationship with us. He wants to invite us into that relationship, the very relationship that God the Father and God the Son have had before eternity passed. God is good because he wants to invite you into that relationship. That is incredible. That is incredible. He says... This is, what, this is what he says in verse 19. I will make all of my goodness pass before you. I will proclaim my name before you. I will be gracious to whom I will be gracious. I will show compassion on whom I will show compassion. Now, that's what the Lord said would happen. Now, now look over in one chapter, one chapter over in, verse, in chapter 34, verse 6. When the Lord passed by in front of him, he proclaimed the Lord, the Lord God, compassionate and gracious. This is the nature of God. Slow to anger, abounding in loving kindness and truth, who keeps loving kindness, who forgives iniquity and transgression and sin, yet he will by no means leave the guilty unpunished. A.W. Tozer said that the way we think about God, what we think about God, is the most important thing about us. I, I couldn't agree more. What we think about God is the most important thing about us. Tozer also said that God never uh, suspends one of his attributes to exercise another. In other words, like we were singing about today, Jesus is the lion and the lamb. He is the God of severity and kindness. He is the God of justice and love. God never suspends one of his attributes to exercise another. I mean, he blows us away, this, the transcendent holiness of God, yet he's the most gracious God you could ever imagine. I just was thinking about this earlier. I was you know, reading Isaiah 6. You feel like God... Man, who, who can even draw near to you? You read Isaiah 6 and you see, okay, Isaiah was undone and the glory of God filled the temple and all the angels are crying holy and he, he, he realizes the condition of his own sin. Yet you read Isaiah 53. In Isaiah chapter 53, the Lord, the Lord Isaiah is, is seeing the very same king he saw in Isaiah chapter 6. That's amazing. The king enthroned who is full of glory and full of holiness, is the suffering servant of Isaiah 53. He is the Passover lamb. We talked about that last Sunday. Because of his incredible love for us, for you, the king of glory put on human flesh and turned down his glory to level one so that we would not die when he is unveiled. Because of his love for us. That's amazing love. 
that the king of glory that Isaiah saw when his lips were touched with a coal of fire and said, your sins are forgiven, it was pointing to the suffering servant of Isaiah 53, the incarnate son of God in human flesh. He became the Passover lamb. And he became, he endured rejection. He endured all kind of loathing and despising and all of this because he was getting ready to pay the ultimate price to be the justification of God's choice for many. Because he is, the, he is just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. Amen. So let's talk just a little bit about some of the attributes of who God is. Because I think we need to be reminded of who God is. I think a lot of times we get, we get caught up into our battles. We get caught up into our crisis. We get caught up into our anxieties, our situations, our struggles. And we lose sight of who God is. And we need, if we're going to recover this divine reset, we need to see God again and who he is. First thing we, we need to know is God is good. Moses said, show me your glory. And God said, I will make all of my goodness pass before you. I was so glad we sang that today in worship, that he is good. God is so incredibly good. We can't even fathom how good God is. In fact, it's in uh, Hosea. I forget the exact verse. I had it down, but I took it out. Hosea, somewhere in Hosea, God says, in the last days that they are going to come trembling to the Lord and to his goodness. That means in the last days, God is going to unveil his goodness to the church and it's going to cause trembling. We never knew you were this good. We bought the lie of the accuser who said, you know, God's not that good. If God was really good, he wouldn't have allowed that to happen or God would have given you this or God had given you that. The relentless accusation of the accuser saying God's really not that good. God's going to break that in the end of the age and he's going to reveal to his people how incredibly good he is. When we think of God's goodness, the first thing that comes to our mind is we think, okay, God's good, therefore he wants to heal my body or pr provide for my finances or give me a destiny or whatever. And God does want to do all that, and that God is good in doing that. Don't, don't get me wrong. But God's ultimate expression of his goodness is not what he does for us. God's not good because he blesses us. God's good because he gives us himself. That is the ultimate expression of the goodness of God is God is not good because he blesses us. God's good because he gives us himself. The incredible goodness of God is revealed not in how the things he does for us, but in who he reveals to us and who he gives to us. God is good because he has invited you. Think about this. He has invited you into the very relationship that the Father and the Son have had by the Spirit for eternity past. That eternal bliss of the triune God in unbroken fellowship and intimacy in eternity past, God invites you into that very relationship. And he loves you so much, he seeks you out, and he has chosen you, and he has invited you into the table of fellowship with the triune God. That's God's goodness. That is God's goodness. My goodness. We have, Jesus said that we've been invited to dine with him, table fellowship with him, the most incredible expression of intimacy with him. Now, but forever. Amazing. That joyful bliss of unity in the triune God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. God says to us, to you, come to me. Enter in that place of intimacy with me. See, God is good. God is so good. He invites you in. He loves you so much. He wants to be near you. He wants to be close to you. He wants you to know him and, and be intimate with him. And a secondary expression of God's goodness is he does want to heal our bodies when we're sick. 
He does want to provide for our needs. He does want to protect us. He does want to bless us. He does want to give us a destiny that fulfills our hearts and good friends. That's with good friends. I mean, that is the nature of God. God wants to bless you. But that's not the ultimate expression. But still, God loves to bless his children. That is the nature of God. God is good. God is good. So let that negative impression of the enemy, that accusation, be washed away. God is good. The next thing the Lord revealed to Moses is God is compassionate. Thank God he's compassionate. Man, we're in trouble if he's not compassionate. I will show compassion on whom I will show compassion. He said the Lord, he proclaimed the name of the Lord in Exodus 34. He said the Lord, the Lord God, compassionate. God is so compassionate towards us. See, whatever it is you're going through, and even the smallest little thing that, you know, others, others might say, this is so small. But if it affects you, it affects him because you're his beloved. If it disturbs you, it disturbs him. God is compassionate. God is compassionate towards you. In fact, when you look at the, the ministry of Jesus in the Gospels, it, you just see it over and over and over. He was moved with compassion. They were like sheep without a shepherd. He was moved with compassion when he saw their distress, when he saw they were demonized, when he saw they were downtrodden, when he saw they were discouraged. Jesus was moved with compassion. Don't think you're, what you're going through, God doesn't see and God doesn't care. He cares greatly. He's compassionate. He's moved with compassion for what you're going through because he's a God of compassion. He loves showing compassion. That's his heart. Because that's his heart, Jesus cares greatly about the physical condition of our bodies and the emotional wholeness of our souls. His heart is gripped with gathering the scattered and seeking the lost. He's intent on leading us into our eternal destiny, keeping us from wandering aimlessly. He deeply desires to protect us from our enemies. God cares about your well-being, physically, spiritually, Emotionally, God cares about your well-being. He wants you whole and he wants you healed. That's the heart of God. Gracious. Uh, I loved just one, one note. Uh, when, when dad was teaching on the healing, I loved what he said, that he is Jehovah Rapha. It's in his nature to provide healing. It's his, he named himself after, I am the God who heals you. His character, his nature is to heal our bodies. His nature is to heal our emotions. His nature is to heal us where we've been wounded, rejected, downtrodden, whatever, despised. God wants to bring healing in our, in our souls, in our bodies. That's his nature. The next thing the Lord revealed to Moses is he said, he said in Exodus 33, 19, I will be gracious to whom I will be gracious. And he said in 34, 6, the Lord, the Lord God, gracious. In other words, God is a God of grace. God is a God of grace. Peter called Jesus, or he called God, the God of all grace. What a name. He is the God of infinite grace. And he wants to give you grace. He wants to release grace to you. He wants to give you grace to be who God's called you to be and to do what God's called you to do. G, uh, John was writing and he said that, that uh, grace, he said that grace and truth were realized in Jesus Christ. The fullness of grace we have received. Paul said that God is able to make all grace abound to you. I love the message of God's grace. Isn't that incredible? God's grace, the abounding grace of God, God's grace is not earned. God's grace is unmerited, meaning that there's nothing you can do to receive it. We don't achieve grace. We receive grace. There's nothing we do to earn it. There's nothing we do to get it except say, God, provide me with your grace. I'm here to receive your grace. God, the God of all grace, wants to release his grace upon you in abundance. That is, that is the nature, the nature of God. 
As I'm preaching this, I remember we were, when we were in Uganda, I don't even know, seven years ago maybe, we were in Uganda, and we've told the story, but uh, it was me, Stephen, and Dad. We were traveling around, I don't know, five or six different cities, a different city every day, and we were preaching to pastors and doing pastors' conferences, so we had to have this one message we all did. I think Dad's was a message on worship, and Stephen was uh, the days of Noah, and, there, and mine was living from the grace within. And I was basically preaching about God's grace, drawing from that grace within. And so every single time, you know, if you've ever been on a mission trip, you know that there's a lot of times where you're challenged, your flesh is challenged, you want a very good meal, but you may not have the best meal or whatever. And so you're, you're, you're really, you're tired, there's warfare, the food's different, you're battling different things. And every single time I would get in a little funk, Stephen especially, dad as well, kind of ed edging him on, would say, you need to draw from the grace within. Uh, you know, basically want to like, sorry, I didn't mean to elbow you in the nose, but every single time, draw from the grace within, draw from the grace within. But it really is true, you know. I don't do it perfectly. I'm sure when I get home today and I get a little grumpy or something, Angie's going to be draw from the grace within. But God's grace is available to us at all times. And his grace comes from within because he is within you. And God wants to release grace. Grace, a lot of people don't really understand what grace is, but grace is not just God's unmerited favor, God's grace is power. God's grace is unmerited power that enables you to be who God's called you to be and it enables you to do what God has called you to do. Where has God placed you? What has God called you to do? Who has God called you to be? Ultimately, like his son, grace is how we get there. And God is a God of all grace, and he's gracious, and he loves to give us grace to be who he's called us to be and to do what he's called us to do. He's patient. He's slow to anger. Goodness, can you imagine if God was not patient with us? I mean, some of the things we do are the very definition of stupidity. <laughs> I mean, some of the things we've done, God, you know, we're just like, Why? What, on, what are you thinking? What on earth are you thinking? Yet God is so patient. God is so patient. That, you know, it says like a day is like a, Lord, a day is like a thousand years to the Lord and a thousand years is like a day. I mean, if God was not patient, there probably wouldn't be anyone in heaven. <laughs> but God is patient. God is so patient with you. God is so patient with me. God is so patient with our hangups. God is so patient with all of our wrongdoings and our shortcomings. God is so patient with us. He, and thank God, thank God he's so patient with us. That doesn't mean he wants to leave us in that condition. It's not an excuse so that we'll live for ourselves, but God's patient with you. God's patient with you. The next thing is, is he's abounding in covenant love. Oh, this is a, this is, you got to get this. God is abounding in covenant love. That word there in Exodus 34, loving kindness just, I won't get to go into the, all the details. Dad's taught on this, but it's a word of covenant love. It basically means God's focus of love directed towards those he's in covenant with. See, God's love for the world is different than his love for his covenant people. God's love for his church is different than his love for the world. They are not the same. God's covenant love is directed towards you. And I like to say it like this. If you think about it, when we were betrothed to Jesus as his bride, we entered into the new covenant. We were betrothed to him. I would even say it like this. God is abounding in love for his bride. Get this, get this. You, because you have Christ in you, because you are saved, because you are born again, you are the betrothed of the Lord. You are the betrothed of the Lord. His love is directed towards you. His kindness is directed towards you. Think about this. He has not rejected you. His, he calls you, he says to you, you are my, my beloved and you are my friend. You are beautiful to me. You are valuable to me. I sought you out. I died for you because of my great love for you. Oh, the revelation 
of the covenant love of God for his bride. Oh, the revelation, if we could just understand the depth and the height and the width and the breadth of the knowledge of God's love, which Paul says no human mind can understand this. It has to be experienced. God's love. God's love heals us from rejection. God's love washes away condemnation. God's love shatters guilt, shame, and all that would bind us up. God's love establishes us and roots us in this deep intimacy with him. God is so for you. God is not against you. It's starting to sound like Joel Osteen. <sighs> that is the nature of God's love for you. That is God's heart for you. That is the love of God for you. It is beyond description. It's covenant love. God's covenant love for you is jealous. God's love for you is jealous. You may not be able to get away with your friend, what your friends get away with, because God is jealous for you. Your other friends can do this. Your other friends can go here. Your other friends can watch this. They can go this way or that way, but not with you. And you think, okay, God, why are you so strict? Why are you so narrow? Why are you so almost like I can't do anything? And God's like, because I love you. Because my eyes of fiery, jealous love are directed towards you, and you are mine, and I am yours, and I am your beloved, and I am your friend. You can't do what they do because you're not going where they're going. God's love for you, his beloved bride, is beyond anything you can fathom. It has to be experienced. That's what Paul was saying in Ephesians 3. The love of God that surpasses knowledge. See, he says, you've got to know the love of God that surpasses knowledge. How can you know something that can't be figured out in the brain? It has to be experienced. The love of God has to be experienced. God is not up there condemning you for every little thing you do. That's not perfect. Let it break into you. You might be a perfectionist. I'm a, I'm, a, I'm a perfectionist. You might be a perfectionist. And if you don't do every single thing right, you get under condemnation. That's not God. God is not the one condemning you for every little tiny thing you did wrong. That's not God. God's love for you never fails. God's, if only we could be rooted and grounded in the love of God. I'm convinced I'm convinced that the number one issue most people face is a root of rejection. Being rejected by family, friends, people, whatever. And the number one solution is the, is the revelation of God's love. To root you and ground you in the love of God experientially. It has to be experienced. His love cannot be uh, I cannot get up here and give you, here's the definition of love. God's love is patient. God's love is, all that means nothing. You've got to experience it by the Holy Spirit. The love of God has been poured out upon your heart by the Holy Spirit. It's not intellectual. It's not in, by information or data. It's not by theology or doctrine. It is the kiss of a king who is madly in love with you. And we need to know his love. A couple more here and we'll bring it to an end. God's forgiving. Because of his love for you, he did whatever it took to bring you into a relationship with him. All of us have done, done some really crazy dumb stuff. You know, I've been telling Anna and some of her friends some of the dumb stuff I've done. And they're like, really, you did that? I'm like, yeah, I was, and I think about it, it was really dumb what I did. I won't say what it is right now, but later if you want to know, you can ask me. But really dumb stuff. Thank God he forgives us of our sins. Thank God he buries it into the sea. Thank God he is not only the God of Isaiah 6, but he's the, he's the God of Isaiah 53. He's not only the transcendent king, but he is the Passover lamb who incarnates himself in human flesh, turns down the radiance of his glory, and dies for us so that he would be just and the justifier of those who have faith in Jesus. He forgives all of your sins, every single one of them, no matter how dark and corrupt 
and evil it is. God, ha God if you call on his name and, and call on the name of Jesus Christ, he forgives you. His blood washes away your sins. He's forgiving. Finally, he's just. He is just. Not only does he forgive, but he's also just. Paul said that God is just. He is the just, he is just and the justifier of him who has faith in Jesus. God is a righteous judge, you know? We're going to stand before the Lord and we're going to stand before the judgment seat of Christ and we're going to give an account for the way we lived on this short time we call life. We're going to stand before, and I, this, is, this is not even the white throne of judgment, this is for believers. We're going to stand before the judgment seat of Christ. God, Paul said, knowing the terror of the Lord. And we're going to give an account for the way we lived our life. How we built our life. Did we build our life on our own soulish, selfish ambitions and desires, or did we build it upon Christ? Did we do what God had called us to do? Did we go where God said to go? Did we say what God said to say? It's a terrifying thing, it is. But I think, I think what's happened in the church, we've lost sight of the judgment seat of Christ. But we're, all of us are going to stand before him. Thankfully, he's just. I mean, he's forgiving and he's gracious. But I think, I think the, Leonard Ravenhill, I forget the exact quote, but Leonard Ravenhill said, if only we lived this life in light of eternity, our lives would be radically different. If only we could have that day standing before us of the judgment seat of Christ. This is not bad news, by the way. This is not bad news. I think the sooner we understand that we are going to appear before his judgment seat, the more radical we'll become in our pursuit of Christ. In a good way, that day puts fear in me, the good fear of God. I don't want to suffer loss on that day. I don't want to have anything burnt. I want to have the fullest of what God wants for me. I want to live this life in light of that judgment seat so that I am ready and don't suffer on that day. He is the just judge with fire in his eyes. And he's also the God of justice. And we have seen in this country incredible injustice. We have seen around this around the world, incredible injustice around the world. There is coming a day when our just judge is going to bring justice in his proper time. Know that. No one's going to get away with anything. No one is getting away with anything before him because he is the righteous judge. So as we bring this message to a close... The first reset God wants to bring back into his church is a divine reset of vision. Not what we do for God, but how we see him. Because if we don't see him as he is, what we do for God will be askew. It will go off in, the, in a direction it doesn't need to go. We will be, end up building something God's not interested in. We need a recovery a vision to see the Lord for who he is in his glory, in his majesty, and his transcendence. Amen. Let's pray. Let's, let's ask the Lord to give us vision. Lord, we just want to come right now. Just if you're hungry for a greater vision of the Lord... Just stand up and raise your hands.
This is something God has to give. I, I, obviously, no man can give us a vision of the Lord. Father, I ask you right now that you might open the eyes of our hearts, Lord. And you might give to us the revelation of Jesus Christ. Lord, that we might see him as he is. Lord, I pray that the false image of Jesus that has been preached in the American church for the past 40, 50 years that has affected any of us, all of us, in some way or another would be broken off, Lord. That we would not have the American Jesus, the prosperity gospel Jesus, but the real Jesus as he is. Lord, would you break off the false images of who what we've heard you to be and would you reveal to us the real Jesus, we pray. Lord, I ask you that we would see once again the Lord high and exalted, the train of his robe filling the temple and the angels cry, holy, holy, holy. Lord, would, we, would you grant to us the eyes to see? Like Paul prayed, Lord, would you open the eyes of our heart, Lord, to see God as he is in glory and majesty and transcendence, holiness, love, Grace, compassion, kindness, severity, just, justice. God, we just say, show us your glory. Just ask the Lord right now to show you his glory. Like Moses, show us your glory, Lord. Lord, I pray that you, Lord, would begin for those that are asking, would begin to really unfold the glory of God to them, to us, to me, to all of us, Lord, who are hungry. Lord, open the eyes of our heart. Let God who spoke light into darkness shine the light of the glory of God in the face of Christ. In our heart, we pray. In the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen.